So I'm going to talk today about uh, commercial uh, vehicle accident reconstruction. This involves those vehicles that are large. A little bit about me, uh, you heard a little bit there. I, uh, I studied here at the University of California, Berkeley in California. I got my PhD down at Caltech and then I was an academic for several years. I taught mechanical engineering and, and there met a guy who had written a book on accident reconstruction. That's how I got into accident reconstruction. Uh, you know, the short version is that I realized my, my colleagues were clinically insane <laughs> in, in academia and I wanted to work with more regular folks and, and, I, and I went out into industry, worked for a while and then found my way around to Rimkus and back to California. So, Jim, Jim you, you're not letting them know about the fine Irish, though. <laughs> Notre Dame professor. So, so the, uh, about 80% or, or close to 90% of all commercial vehicle accidents are driver related, particularly recognition and decision that you know when you get in an accident you have to perceive oh I'm in trouble uh, you have to make a decision that you are in trouble and what to do to get out of it and then you have to take an action to get out of it. the perception decision reaction time and um, that factors into about 90 percent it's a driver related so if I'm distracted and I'm on the cell phone I don't perceive soon enough if uh, if uh, I'm fatigued I might not uh, make the decision rapid, rapidly enough, or I might not make the right decision. And so uh, that tends to make up about most of the accidents. About 10% are vehicle related. So uh, these tend to break down into uh, these categories. It might be the amount of load might play a factor. If, you have, if you're overloaded, for example, the type of load, you have loads that can shift inside the container as you're driving along. Uh, the tire inflation level can play a little bit of a role if it affects handling. Of, but one of the, the, the most common is brake problems. If you have a problem with your braking system on a large vehicle, then you, you can get yourself in trouble pretty quickly. And then cargo distribution can play a role as well, again, with rolling uh, of large vehicles. So according to the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, there were 3 million, million roadside inspections of trucks, and of those, 25% were found to have serious problems. And a lot of times that's the brakes, and the brakes are out of adjustment. So one of the first things we do when we look at a vehicle is go under and check the brakes and make sure they're within the legal limits of being properly adjusted. Um, that continued into 2012. It had thankfully dropped a little bit, but still one out of five of those vehicles that you pass on the road has a problem with some part of its mechanical operation. How, how is that handled? by the uh, drivers and the truck trucking companies those the, violations were inspections those violations were uh, you're pulled off the road that, those are the serious types of violations and you get written up and you have to do a repair before you can proceed on as I understand it so it has to be uh, handled there immediately especially for the serious violations so in an in investigation as we would perform it uh, first would involve any reporting that has gone on. Is there a, a police report? That, that really helps a lot. Uh, any background reports on, on the driver and what, you know, how much time they've spent on the road, where they were going, where they were coming from. Uh, then we might go out to the scene and see exactly what happened out there. Tire marks on the road can be very useful in reconstructing what happened. Uh, then a vehicle examination, we would go uh, look at the vehicle. And there's always gonna be a lot of pressure to look at the vehicle get it back on the road making money. And so that's usually, a lot of times that's what we do first, is get out there, look at the vehicle, and, uh, and make sure we document it all, make sure all the parties can document it all, and then it can get back into service. Any driver and witness interviews, I don't uh, carry those out very often myself. A lot of times the, the legal profession or the insurance surer, the insurance adjuster will perform some of those view, uh, interviews, take those statements. There'll be police statements taken, taken by the police, excuse me, as well. So after I gathered a lot of information, then I would go sit down at my desk and try to reconstruct what happened. And um, there might be some technical follow-up on some of the finer points. There's conflicting statements, uh, trying to figure out exactly what did and didn't happen. And then what we do in, in reconstruction is we try to, you, what we can see is how it all ended up, and we just do physics in reverse. Do time, you know, negative time travel. <laughs> we just try to work it back from where they ended up to where they hit, and to where they were before they hit. And then in the end, we understand what factors caused or contributed to that accident. So Jim, what we want to talk about here today is the reconstruction side, which Jim talks about, but also he's involved in the investigation side. But as he talked about, part of the investigation side is also conducted by the adjusters, 
a large part really early on in the case until they retain counsel. Um, but then also counsel needs to get thoroughly involved in the investigation. And the investigation obviously continues throughout litigation as well. Absolutely. There, there's usually a discussion around the black box. And so I've had, uh, you know, I've had both sides of a case and the owner of the vehicle says, I'm not going to download the data off my own vehicle because once it's downloaded, then it should be shared and it might be incriminating. It might not. I don't know. But they might, add, then the other parties might say, look, I want to download the data. And there's a lot of discussion. I'm involved in one right now about when and where and how that's going to, who's going to do it and who's going to pay for it and so forth. But I'll talk more about black boxes as we move along. So uh, commercial vehicles, some of the major factors, what makes them different from passenger vehicles is their size and weight. So because they're so large, they're not very maneuverable. They need a lot of room to turn. They can't swerve out of the way like you can on a motorcycle, for example. Uh, they can try to swerve, and they do, but you, the trailer doesn't move as quickly as the cab, and, and instead of hitting with the, the cab, they hit with the trailer. And they're a lot harder to stop. We'll see that in a little bit. Their stopping distances are quite longer. The, their visibility can be low. Uh, if you climb into a big rig, a lot of times you'll see in the passenger vehicle down below, on the, uh, on the, in the passenger side, excuse me, on the passenger door, down about foot level, there's a little window because there's an incredible blind spot right there. And that little window is supposed to allow the driver to see down there and see if anybody's there before he makes his right turn. Um, so visibility can be difficult. Some of them have a large nose, and if, if a bicyclist comes right out in front of them, they may not even see him, even a pedestrian, when they're sitting you know, or moving very slowly up to an intersection. And then the components are different. The engines are diesel. You know, there are passenger vehicles with diesel engines, but these are serious diesel engines. They can go like a million miles. They can run up to a million miles on these engines. And uh, they operate a little differently. The braking system is completely different from your car. And uh, they almost always have a trailer, which is what we call an articulated vehicle, which changes the dynamics significantly. Um, you know, the cab can be doing one thing and then the trailer another, and they can affect each other. So the more interesting physics from my point of view. So what we need when we start an investigation is uh, we like to know the point of impact. When we reconstruct, really, I should say, when we reconstruct an accident, we need to know uh, the final resting positions. Uh, if there was braking prior to impact, if there are tire marks prior to impact, we'd like to know about those and get out there and measure them. And if there were any visibility obstructions in, that pl might have played a role in the incident. Jim, what kind of things affect tire marks? How they're laid down, how long they are, things like that. So uh, mainly it's a function of the coefficient of friction on the road, right? And so uh, you have to have a system that will lock up. Most of your passenger vehicles now won't lock up, but Contrary to what you might believe, you can still get a tire mark with an anti-lock brake system. It's just not as dark. Um, and so the length of the tire mark is determined by how fast the guy was going and what the friction is on the road. And so some, some guys will go out and try to measure friction right on the road. What we do is assume a range of friction coefficients, and so we can get a range of how fast he was going. So, uh, you know, that's a common question with somebody speeding, and, and the tire marks usually tell us that fact. How does the uh, coefficient coefficient of friction vary oh and what can, factors are involved so it, it the roughness of the road and what there is the road uh, cement or is it bituminous asphalt if it's uh, and it, and then if there's ice or water on it as well any weather conditions as well so it can vary from 0 0.3 which may not mean anything to you but up to 0 0.7 which is quite a wide range. If the maximum value is 0 0.7, it can, it can vary about 50%. And so it's really a key assumption in the analysis and should be well established there. Or if you don't know the exact value, you should use a range. And so you can put some error bars or some a range on your final result. So given that we want to know point of impact, uh, resting position, any tire marks that were made, it's important to get to the site as soon as possible. And, uh, you know, we can get there at Rimkus, we can do, be on 24-7 alert for you and get there immediately after the accident. You might not even know about it, though. And so it, within a week would be really good time. Uh, tire marks will still be there. 
uh, debris will still be there, gouge marks will still be there, and, and if the police have done a real thorough investigation, they put paint marks down where the resting positions were, and we can get all that information gathered up real quick, and then with that type of inf information can pretty much tell you what happened. So this is a, uh, this is a typical accident. There's a passenger vehicle at a stop sign, along comes the big rig. The passenger vehicle pulls out in front of the big rig and he can't stop in time and he hits the passenger vehicle. This one's showing him hitting the passenger vehicle near the rear. Uh, if, he, if he hits right on the driver door, it can be a fatality. If he hits on the, pass, on the rear tire or the passenger door, it's just a spin out. So it comes down to a matter of fractions of a second, you know, in our calculations to, to determine whether or not this you know, would have been a fatality or not. But then the, the passenger car slides away, the, the, the large truck barely feels it, but does move a little bit. And this is the scene you have after the fact. There's a tire mark laid down by the truck. There's some tire marks made by the passenger vehicle as it got hit. And then there's the surrounding environment. So uh, I was going to say, that gives you what you would expect. But how does that relate to what you actually find at the scene? And then how do you work backwards to figure out what best matches the physical evidence? So H Highway 99 uh, down in Modesto, uh, uh, Fresno area, is one of the busiest roads I, I can imagine that's in the United States. I was down there investigating an accident, and I couldn't even run across two lanes. I had to stand there for five minutes waiting for a break so I could just run across two lanes and get across. In that type of an environment, um, it's going to be, there's going to be new marks put down. There's another accident the next week. I, I did an investigation uh, more north in Stockton area. And uh, uh, while I was out there investigating an accident in this location, another one occurred. I witnessed <laughs> almost of the same type. And so there were a lot of tire marks. So this has been going on for a while. Um, and so when you get out there, it's a lot more confusing. This is an idealization, right? But we, that's our job is to go out there and go, this is the tire from that vehicle, the tire mark, excuse me, and this is the tire mark from that vehicle, and then let's picture, take pictures of all the other ones in case we change our minds later, but certainly this is how it looks like it happened. So a fluid spill is nice. It, it kind of tells you um, sometimes exactly how the car was oriented after the fact in case uh, it's been hauled away. You can figure out which end is front. And then we measure the, the lengths of these tire marks. We always get a reference point, like a light pole. And uh, just measure the lengths of everything. We have what we call a total station. And so we can actually just go out and map it and then read that, all that data into a nice software package that'll make us a nice, pretty picture. And in very serious accidents, the police do a more thorough job at yeah. the scene, marking certain yeah. spots and taking certain measurements. That's my experience. You know, if there's a fatality at the scene, they, they know this is serious business and, and they might paint mark where vehicle resting positions were. If there wasn't a fatality, or, but it turns out to be one later on, somebody got injured and then they died later on, they, they might not have. Uh, that's why it's important to get out there pretty quickly. Even paint marks wear away. In, you know, I know we, have, we live in sunny California and there's not a lot of weather, but there's a lot of traffic and just those tires rolling over the paint slowly erase those marks away and they'll be gone I, uh, within three months I would say generally your, mark, your markings can be gone here in California Jim, Le less if it snows and ice. When, ice you go, when you go out there and there's a number of people representing a number of different uh, parties um, what type of people are usually retained from the company standpoint besides the accident reconstructions they have their own safety engineers that are out there that are charged with this type of investigation who do, you, who do you work with? Uh, we see, we see uh, the safety engineers, like you mentioned. We also see people who are more focused on the loading of the vehicle as well. So that's not, that might not necessarily be accident reconstruction, but they're well versed in what the loading regulations require when you put a load on a truck and making sure that it's properly balanced and it's not going to shift, which is really important because uh, once it shifts, then the truck behaves differently and, and a safe turn becomes an unsafe turn. And then, you know, we of course see the attorneys and we see adjusters, and then we also might see some biomechanicists, folks who are looking at the injuries and seeing if they uh, are consistent with the mechanics of the accident as well. Okay. How about you and factors, people? 
to deal with lighting and things of that nature, or public officials, if you're dealing with an intersection that might have been marked improperly. I haven't seen a lot of public officials, but that's certainly something to consider. Like that example I just said, if there's a location where there's a lot of accidents, there might be some action to be to take against the municipality for not properly, you know, signing or maybe putting a street light on that intersection. Um, human factors. To me, human factors means uh, whether or not the steering wheel is at the right height and you know that everything's in reachable components. So uh, there are experts out there who look at de perception, decision, reaction time, and there are folks that do lighting. I have done lighting myself to see, you know, could you even see that pedestrian as they crossed in front of the big rig? Um, so you'll, you'll sometimes see individuals that do that specifically, or you'll so sometimes see a guy like me wearing one or two hats out there doing both the visibility study and the reconstruction. So there's a lot of information to gather, I think, is what this tells you. The other thing we might look at is line of sight. If you were to have had, you know, a, a wall here, but even just a giant bush, something that hadn't been trimmed back, then I don't know if, yeah, you, this guy cannot see very far. And although he's legally stopped at the stop bar, he really should inch forward so that he could see. And, and it works in reverse. If this is a, an obstacle and that stop bar is too far back, it may be that this guy, when he finally sees this vehicle, there's no way he can stop. It's just too late. And so perhaps um, designing or, or changing of the roadway would occur. Uh, I saw this at one place where there was an intersection and there, the, the municipality actually decided to make an over underpass just because it was a busy road with a small street and they just said, we're having too many accidents here, we're gonna dig. So in evidence gathering, we look at uh, the site inspection, physical information, the tire marks, rest and impact position, and the pre-impact environment, that line of sight. And um, these tire marks are photoshopped into this picture. <laughs> this is absolute fantasy. <laughs> uh, we'll also look at the site distance. Um, this is what it normally looks like. How soon after the accident was that picture taken? This is about a week later. You got oil spill, you got fluid spills everywhere. Oh, and I uh, pushed the wrong button. You got fluid spills everywhere. You got tire marks that look like they're part of the incident, but what about on the other side of the road? And you got to sort of, it's like reading tea leaves. You got to figure out what's relevant and what's not. I worked with a guy named Matt, and uh, he liked to play devil's advocate all the time. So we had a case where we just could not work it out. There were several tire marks and there was one tire mark. And finally I said to him, this tire mark does not belong to this case. This, it must have come. And he, we were out there one week after. And he says, you mean to tell me, he starts playing devil's advocate, that somehow within one week's time, somebody went out there and had another accident in the same spot and put down new tire marks. That's, that's the only way it works out. We finally got the police photos taken the day of the accident and those tire marks were made when they extracted the vehicle. They just dragged it out and put down extra tire marks. Uh, everything worked out. After that, we understood the whole case. So it takes some time some, in some cases. So the big, the, the unique issues for commercial vehicles with respect to, it, with comparison to passenger vehicles is mass, right? We already talked about it. They're huge. Does anybody know the maximum allowable weight? 80,000 pounds. Your vehicle weighs about 4,000 pounds. If you're driving a big vehicle, your little Honda Civic is closer to 2,000 pounds. So 80,000 to, to 4,000 pounds, that's about a factor of 20, about 20 times heavier than you. It's not quite a mosquito and an elephant, but it is the same ratio as a passenger vehicle to a guy like me, 4,000 pounds to about 200 pounds. I wouldn't tangle with a passenger vehicle as a pedestrian. In your passenger vehicle, you shouldn't tangle with a commercial vehicle. You're just outweighed. And so this isn't going to end well for this guy, and, and it didn't end well for this guy either. So this driver of this big rig jumped down and walked away. Probably didn't feel any change in velocity. You know, he weighs so much, it wasn't violent for him. The big rigs don't have airbags. Why? They don't need them. They're so big, they don't really experience a lot of change in velocity when they hit something else, unless they hit another big rig, and then it all, all bets are off. Yeah, I should say as a practical matter, I've got a case now involving an ag case, and it's got a double trailer full of tomatoes, 
and the entire rig with the trailers is about 80,000 pounds. And what we hit, we never knew we hit it. And we were walking away, going somewhere else, and someone had to inform us that we had hit something. So that's the mass we're talking about, about the size of the tomato truck, fully loaded. If they, if they want to go in your lane, let them. <laughs> you know, just slow down. You know, have your, it's all yours, buddy. And then the other issue that's unique to commercial vehicles is their stopping distance, right? So a car has a stopping distance at 60 miles per hour with a high coefficient of friction road, about 170 feet. A car on a wet road, the coefficient of friction drops to maybe 0.6, and you're up to like 210 feet. Uh, a tractor trailer might have a, a lower coefficient of friction for reasons I won't go into, but even larger stopping distance. So 240 feet is almost a football field, right? 300 feet, eh, you know, what is that? Divided by three, it's about 80 yards, right? Almost a full football field. That's a long way. So a truck traveling 60 miles an hour puts their brakes on on the goal line that will take to until the, the other goal line. Across midfield to, to the... Come to a complete stop. Yeah. So you don't want to pull in front of them. They look like they're far away, but they're not. Let them go. <laughs> a motorcycle, if you've taken any training on a motorcycle, they say never use the rear brake only. Always use both, both brakes because with just the rear brake, you have hardly any stopping power. But, so they're the worst with just the rear brake. But if you use both brakes, front and back, then you're the best at stopping. So that's good training. And then... If you have a diesel vehicle like a big rig, you know, in one of these pileups, maybe in the Thule fog down in the Central Valley, they spill diesel fuel all over the road, coefficient of friction drops down to almost 0.3, and, and, and a car just can barely stop. Their stopping distance becomes 436 feet, well over a football field. So the, the thing is to remember here is your tractor trailer is, is the worst at stopping. And how does it stop? It uses a completely different system. So Get out your pencils and draw this diagram, and then, and then we'll go. It's complicated. I think this is all it's supposed to tell you. And um, the main thing is it uses air. It's a pneumatic system. In your passenger vehicle, it's a hydraulic system. You use brake fluid. And uh, when you press it, it compresses the brake fluid, and that actuates the braking mechanism that slows down your car. In your truck, it has a spring brake that's always on. It just, it's, it's a fail-safe design that's always on. And it uses air, you apply air to push the brake off. When you turn the vehicle on, it pressurizes up and the brakes come off. And then when you push the brake pedal, it releases air and the brakes go on. So this is why when the big bus pulls up and you're ready to get on, he hits his brakes and it goes, Psh! it makes a big sound. That's because it's releasing air and now the brakes are on. So it's an air system. That's the brake system that you're hearing. And um, why did we use air? in large vehicles. Well, with a hydraulic system, you have to press with your foot and that compresses the fluid and it's sort of limited by your strength, but also whatever me mechanical, we have power brakes now that, that assist. But in, a, in an air system, your braking power can be determined by that spring loadedness and you can get a lot more braking power. Um, but it's, the, bra the brakes themselves are not disc. They're simple drum brakes. They're simple so drum brakes. They've been that way for a long, long time. Only recently I've started to see a few disc brakes on large vehicles, but they're just drum brakes. But they, have, they operate pneumatically and can th therefore get a lot more braking power. But even the, the disc brakes that you're seeing now, they'll be with a air system. Yes. They still won't go hydraulic. There's an air system. And why air? Because, uh, I don't know, yeah. Is that difficult to read? It looks a little faint. They're easy to connect and disconnect. There are brakes on the trailer. You got to have brakes on every axle. Um, you can tow a boat, a smaller boat, behind your F-150 truck, and it doesn't have brakes on the axle. But if you get a larger boat, then you'll start putting brakes on the on that trailer, uh, boat trailer on that back axle. Every big rig has brakes on the back end. It's more robust stopping power for reasons I talked about, and it's a fail-safe design. So the way I designed, I described it. It's a spring, it's on, you pressurize the system, it comes off, and then when you push the brake pedal, you let some of the pressure out so that the brakes are applied. If I'm driving down the road and I hit, you know, uh, somebody left a wrench in the road, it pops up and hits my brake line and cracks it wide open, all the pressure goes out of the system and the brakes go on. 
So in your car, if that happens, it hits your hydraulic system, all the fluid drains out, let's say, you have no brakes, and then you're in for a wild ride. The trucker, he's just driving along, he hears something, and then he looks in his rearview mirror and he sees smoke coming off his tires, and he knows his brake system has failed on his trailer. You've seen the evidence of that. You're driving down I-5, you're in the slow lane, because the trucks are always in the slow lane. You see all of a sudden two tire marks, just isolated, just on one side of the truck. They go for a while, then they go off the road and they stop. Guy's brake system failed, brakes slammed on, he pulled over to figure out what the heck happened. But how does that happen? Does just one axle typically will fail? And the, 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 that line to that axle fails, or it's not like the entire trailer locks up. And the you cab can, certainly isn't locking up unless can, that line. If you lose your compressor, the whole system, and all, you know, all, all axles will lock up. If you just break one line in one place that goes to one axle, then, then that will only go, you know, go automatically on. So it can you, happen in all different ways. If you have a total failure, though, across the system, mm -hmm. because they all go out at once, what's the risk of a serious accident as a result of all the, all the brakes are actuated? You're going to come to a rapid stop, uh, and you're going to get hit from behind, probably, if you're in traffic. You know, you're not going to be able to maneuver off, like I described with just that two-axle type problem. The cons is that the, the system, as you saw, is very complex and can cost a lot more. But we, we want it for the safety of these vehicles. If we're going to share the road with them, we want them to have the best brakes they can have. And then um, because they are different and they have to be checked, and then the, uh, you need a, a specialized license to operate a vehicle that has these types of brakes on them. So it's the opposite of your car. It's a fail-safe design until, instead of a fail and die design. <laughs> I, my wife always said, why don't we put that on a regular car too? Why don't you have a fail-safe design on the car? Uh, the hydraulic system is cheaper, like we said, and it works pretty well. And we've, we've protected it in the way we route everything in your passenger car, so it's not uh, as, as easily damaged in any kind of normal environment. Uh, so the, the reason this came about was a guy named George Westinghouse, he invented this design for railroad cars. He realized that they were very heavy and dangerous, and he thought a fail-safe design would have, would have to do. And so when you turn it on, you must pressurize the system. There's a charging, and that uh, allows the brakes to, uh, to disengage. And then as the brakes are applied, the air pressure decreases, and the, and the brakes re-engage. And then if nobody's on there, if there's no power to the system, and I've already explained this, then the brakes come on right away. That's what one brake looks like. This is, these are the air lines coming in. They pressurize this area, which actuates this little arm, and that rotates this uh, handle, basically, which then activates the brakes inside. So we crawl underneath and make sure this is the right length and make sure nothing bad has happened to the system that it's operating properly that might have contributed to or caused whatever accident you had. And more often than not, all this investigation that you're doing ends up pointing to the driver. Yes. And human error. Yeah. Okay. A lot of time what we're doing, you know, the driver always says, oh, you know, all hell broke loose. I don't know. I heard a big clump or, you know, the brakes went out. I don't know what happened. Or, and, so, and usually we go through our mechanical exam just checking the boxes and saying, no, the brakes checked out. You know, look at the next component and make sure everything was operating properly. Another unique thing about commercial vehicles is rollovers. Basically, what this engineering chart tells you is the higher, the more you stack heavy stuff up inside the trailer, the higher its center of gravity is, and the more likely it is to tip over. That's why your sports cars are low and small. They have a very low center of gravity in the corner really well. If you, uh, so I did a case where they loaded broccoli in the back. We're in the California, we grow everything, tomatoes and, and broccoli. And that broccoli could shift. It was just sort of loaded straight in. It's like water a little bit, right? When you, if you tilt it, some of the little broccoli spears will roll and tumble. And that kind of, that, that gave it a high center of gravity. And then when, it, when the vehicle went into a turn, it shifted the center of gravity and, and caused a rollover. That's not this case here, but this is what rollovers look like. They can be extremely expensive. When they fall on the passenger vehicle next to them, somebody dies. When they fall over, uh, overpasses, they cause extensive damage. Uh, it can cost millions of dollars to fix the overpass if they choose the particularly wrong place to have this happen. So that's what that would look like. And then there's all the cleanup, the cost of the cleanup. I did one that was loaded with empty bottles. What a mess, right? There was another one recently It was loaded with beer. 
that was a mess, and it stunk. <laughs> you know, it just stunk to high heaven because it caught fire too. So you had that mix of burned and that mix of stale beer, like a fraternity house that just burned down or something. <clears throat> yeah. After an hour, you kind of go, okay, can we finish up? <laughs> and then, uh, and I, another guy told me I didn't have this one, but he had cigarettes that apparently hadn't been taxed yet, and they had to get ATF out there to keep an eye on them because people were trying to sneak in and steal cigarettes and carry them away from the scene. So the, the black box is not unique to commercial vehicles, but it's something that we get the most questions about. It, it is different from what's in a passenger vehicle, though, so I'll try to point that out to you now. Um, it's called an engine control module, or an electronic control module, and it's got an acronym called an ECM. You'll hear ECM, ACM, PCM, CDR, EDR, all these acronyms to describe what you should just call a black box. <laughs> just call it a black box. Everybody gets that, right? It's like on the plane. It's not black, it's not a box, but it, it does the same thing. Um, it's specific to the manufacturer, right? So, and if you have a Freightliner, it probably has a Detroit diesel engine in it, but the manufacturer of the engine on commercial vehicles is not the same as the manufacturer of the chassis. And like your Toyota has a Toyota engine and a Toyota chassis, not so with a commercial vehicle. So it's really, we need the, usually the VIN number, the vehicle identification number for the big rig so we can look that up and find out who made the engine in it before we go out and download data. Because it's, the data's coming off the engine, not out of the cab. It's a box bolted to the side of the engine because it controls the engine. And the electrical system needs to be somewhat operational. So that beer truck that I just told you about, it was two trucks, a truck on truck. It was a crossover, so the closing speed was close to 100 miles an hour and two trucks hit each other, destroyed the two vehicles. The, there was no electrical system. It was impossible to download. So my option then is just take the ECM off the engine, take it back to the lab and do it there. I crawl around, I look at it, it's destroyed too. It was cracked open and bubbling because of the fire that occurred afterwards. So no data was gonna be had off of that vehicle. Sometimes it happens that way. Usually though, like I said earlier, the big rig is so big, it wins the collision and therefore it's hardly damaged and we can download it you know, the next day. So there's usually a port underneath the dash. We bring our little laptop. This is for a cat, a Caterpillar engine. And we have a uh, communication module, we plug into the port, we plug into the laptop, and on a good day we hit return and it downloads the data. That's the way it works in training. That's, you know, <laughs> it's always something. <laughs> you know, we gotta pull out batteries and power up the system. We gotta find out where, where it went wrong. But it gives you a ton of data. So it's an engine control module. Its primary function is to control the engine and record data from the engine to make sure the engine is running properly and efficiently. But it also records data about the driver and the trip. So drivers will tell you about being called into the corporate office and they say, hey, we got a problem with you speeding. Oh, I didn't speed, I don't speed at all, I'm a safe driver. And then they pull out the ECM data. They can just download data off this truck. 5% of the time you're going 80 miles per hour. Cut, you know, busted. <laughs> it records all that data. So it, has a, it records the top engine RPM, the amount of time spent like 60 to 80 miles per hour, uh, 40 to 60, and so on. You know, it breaks it into, it, into brackets. It tells you cruise control, trip start date and end date. Sometimes the dates are wrong, so we always hold a, we always hold a, um, a cell phone up that has the day and date, and, and then we compare it to what the ECM tells us today's date is when we're downloading it just to make sure there's no problem later on. Tells us the odometer, the trip distance, how far they had gone at the time of the incident, average and highest speed, date and time of highest speed, number of vehicle over speeds, date and time of diagnostic code. That's when maybe the engine had a problem that might say, hey, you know, the check engine light came on. Uh, the event is, the, um, is when there might have been an impact, more on that in a second. The, the Max are notoriously wrong with the event date, so you have to be cautious around them. Uh, yeah. How about, how about do they give you some insight to try and determine, at least indirectly and not conclusively, mm -hmm. but how long the vehicle had been operated, had it been running continuously for 16, 18 hours? 
You can tell the last time the vehicle came to rest, for example? You can get some of that data. It depends from module to module. Okay. But yeah, you, you can definitely get that. It, it'll tell you on this trip how much time was spent in idle. When I first started downloading vehicle, vehicles, I was surprised that a lot of time is spent at zero miles per hour until I realized that they pull over to the side of the road and sleep and then they might leave the engine running, you know, to stay warm in certain parts of the country. And we can use that, obviously, to find out whether or not he adhered to the law in terms of taking breaks and uh, taking time off and rest periods in order to comply with the applicable law. So I missed it. It's on this list. There's hard stop data. So in, in your motor vehicle, in your passenger vehicle, there, the data is not gathered by something that's on the engine. It's gathered by something that controls the airbags. And so it tries to detect a collision and fire the airbags. It's always watching and then and, and it's looking for an unsafe environment. The ECM, the engine control module, there are no airbags on the rig. It records a hard stop. And that just means the guy might have been driving down the road, jamming out to Keith Urban and said, oh, Denny's, I wanted to go to Denny's. And he might hit the brakes real hard and head down. It'll record that. And then he comes out of Denny's and goes get, gets in a wreck. It'll record the wreck and overwrite the Denny's stop. He gets in the wreck, he drives home, he sees Denny's, the, the Denny's stop will overwrite the wreck. So if you don't download it, you really need to take it out of service and leave it until it can be downloaded because that, that hard stop will be overwritten. This is what a hard stop data report looks like for a Detroit diesel. Um, hard break number one. Sometimes now on the newer models they are starting to record one and two so you don't have that overwrite problem. You can see here vehicle speed on the left and time on the uh, bottom of this graph. So this starts one minute before the quote unquote event, the hard stop. He's going about 55 miles per hour, good for him. Starts to slow down some and then really starts braking hard. And the, the algorithm that detects a hard stop, define the hard stop at zero time here, somewhere around 15 miles per hour. Then you can see he continued on afterwards, maybe five miles per hour. So uh, this is really useful data. It tells you whether or not the guy was speeding. It, so there are laws about, though, who can download the data. In the state of California, it is the owner, registered owner of the vehicle. Exactly. And um, not, it does, in Washington, it's the registered owner of the vehicle at the time of the accident. So it means that you could conceivably buy the vehicle and then download it if the owner was going to sell it to you in California. I don't think that's happened. It just seems to be a small loophole in the, in the law. We have to get permission from the registered owner of the vehicle before we can download data from it. That might be the insurance company or the leasing company. It's sometimes difficult to dig, dig it out. And if you're an adverse party, yeah. a lot of times it'll take litigation. So then uh, there's a federal law now that you'll hear people talk about. It doesn't say that you have to download data. It just says if you choose to download, if you choose to record data on a vehicle, you're a vehicle manufacturer, here's the list of stuff you have to record. But you don't have to record it. So not all vehicles download data. So like uh, Joe just mentioned, with some vehicles you can get into trouble. Uh, trying to down, if it's your own vehicle, you can download it. If you have permission from your client, you can go download and see what you have, but sometimes they don't want to do it, like I said earlier. And if it's the other side, uh, you can, you got to get permission and it can be difficult to do, especially if it's destructive in that you need to take the box off the vehicle and do it in a lab. And sometimes you may not want it in your expert's file or your consultant's file. <laughs> if the plaintiff's not going to do it to your vehicle, why do it yourself? Since it's absolutely critical. Yeah. So, in summary of my part, most incidents are driver related. Uh, we do mechanical evaluations primarily to rule out a mechanical issue and then turn it back around into a, a driver issue. The commercial ve vehicles have these, this large mass, large stopping distance, unique brakes, and they're subjected to rollovers more often than other vehicles. And so those are things we have to consider. Uh, we always say this, get your reconstructionist involved early. The sooner we can get out to a scene, the better, especially if it's a fatality. I think you know it's going to be a large loss. Move and, and get us out there. Um, and then always remember you can download data. If it's appropriate, you know, and like Joe just said, if you think it's going to help your case, do it. If you don't think it's going to help your case, might even hurt you, make them do it. That's, that's the way it's always played out. So with that, Joe's going to talk a little bit more about the legal side.
Uh, we don't have much time left, so I'll have to go through it fairly quickly. Um, first of all, trucking law, depending on if you're dealing with interstate carriers or intrastate carriers, different bodies of law apply. But assuming you have already begun the investigation we've talked about, what you should be doing, carriers in particular, is rounding up all the insurance information you can. And in order to do that, you have to obviously get the insurance policies that would be in play. And that's primarily with regard to your vehicle. But if you're a, sub, you're a truck owner or a truck, trucking company, then you have sub haulers, you've got trailer owners, and you have to, and suppliers as well, and shippers and handlers sometimes, their insurance policy involved. For example, you could have shipper liability if they were the ones that stacked your load. So you want to find out their ins insurance information as well. And it's going to take a lot of cooperation from a lot of people. And so from the very beginning, you are trying to find out as much insurance information as you can. And it's not always easy. So you definitely want to get the policy. You want to get, as I say, if I could just there we go. The insurance policies, the deck pages, which are important, the schedule of autos. Um, a common theme in trying to find available insurance you have to look beyond what's scheduled, what auto is actually named. Very often, other people's insurance, other, for example, if you may be a sub hauler, your truck may be covered because you've attached to a trailer of someone else, um, or the trucking company's insurance may be in effect, and you don't know that. You may even have a contract which requires you to list them as an additional insured and provide them insurance, but you may not have done that, but that doesn't mean that there's not an insurance policy out there that's gonna cover your vehicle. And so you, you constantly are looking for coverage. You get all the coverage information you have when we talk about endorsements in particular that you can find uh, to cover those autos, get certified policies, find out who's self-insured and s go after those assets as well. But then as soon as you get this insurance information, analyze it as best you can and then tender it and follow up. Very often in uh, trucking litigation, the insurance maze is so complex that it really is not that fair to let your defense counsel do it on, on his own or on her own. Usually you need to bring in coverage counsel, depending on the complexities of the claims, which will be more or less complex depending on the injuries and the level of property damage. So one of the most important things you can do. And it's a never-ending process. And that may go, in the end, you may have to file a lawsuit yourself to get that information that you need and to conduct the coverage analysis that you have to do. One of the best sources of the information itself is to try and get the information, excuse me, from, from the brokers themselves. You can also go on the internet now and find out insurance information about the trucking company and the federal website, which requires a lot of this insurance information to be listed, so it's important for you to get. Uh, you need the contracts between all the parties. You have contractor agreements, subcontractor agreements, sub hauler agreements, uh, leasing agreements, and all of those contain AI requirements and also contain indemnity provisions. All of those need to be looked at. And once you do all that, then you do your tenders, as I said before, and continue the process. Um, we've talked a lot about investigation. I won't go into it in great detail. Uh, we do work hand in hand trying to do the things that each, each of us need to do to complete the investigation. Um, uh, the most important thing is really some companies are big enough to where they have their own safety engineers. They have investigation teams that go out and in investigate accidents and gather information on your behalf, work alongside. A lot of times someone like Jim wouldn't necessarily be hired until there's litigation. They may have their own safety engineer or they rely on consultants they may hire, which may be CHP officers that are reasonably skilled in a lot of the investigations, depending on the level of investigation that needs to be done. But documentation, gathering all of that, and then deciding, assuming you've uh, retained counsel, either in-house or otherwise, deciding who's gonna do the investigation for you. As an attorney, you can conduct some investigation, but if it comes to witnesses, you really don't wanna get involved because you will then be conflicted out. You won't be able to re represent your client if you're actually physically interviewing witnesses and asking them questions that you will be called upon later to discuss. And you wanna avoid that if at all possible. Um, uh, experts other than Jim in an investigation like this, you might have to in hire some type of investigation, investigation uh, or private detectives to talk about drivers and find out about drivers, 
find out about trucking companies, things of that nature, and to do is find out as much information about some of your adversaries in the case or your co-defendants as you can. Um, accident reports, obviously, is very important. Later on, if you've got damages, medical damages, to get all the medical records, to gather all the statements you can, not just the police officer, to conduct interviews yourself for witnesses that are involved in the accident. Uh, and then preserve the evidence. What Jim's doing, Jim often is asked to preserve evidence. Um, and he's required to preserve evidence or at least make it available for inspection. And this can happen early on in investigations. And if you don't make it available, or God forbid you destroy it, or you put it back to use after you've repaired it, and no one's had an opportunity to inspect it, it can cause real problems down the line. And you can get spoliation of evidence sanctions. And you can either be sanctioned for your conduct, or they can issue jury instructions to the jury that to, to, to disregard because you haven't put forward the best evidence possible. So it's very important that you take care of the evidence, that you have a clear chain of custody, either if you can't afford it, which is not always the case. Uh, in a couple of cases of mine, they make the available the vehicle, people come and inspect it, they then repair the vehicle or the train or whatever other type of vehicle and then put it back into use because these trucks are very valuable and they make them a lot of money and they want to get their trucks as back as soon as possible. So you, if you are in a situation where that's your situation, then make sure that you do that. The accident investigation, we've talked about getting all the drivers involved. As Jim talked about, it's, impo it's important to know the owners of the vehicles, not just the drivers, and to find out who are the decision makers. You also want to know the employment relationships and the agency principles involved for the different entities. As I said, the, just a single accident, one side could have three or four different defendants easily. So you want to go ahead and, and do that research. You also want to do things that Jim necessarily doesn't do, which involves weather, highway design issues, and that goes to public entities to the extent you know. And you got to watch because you have to present a claim to a public entity if you, if you have one within six months of a complaint being filed against you. So you have to do the investigation into the public entity side of your case. You have to know if it's a dangerous intersection. You have to know the history of that intersection. And you need to find out the information that's going to support a claim against the city and ultimately suing the city by way of cross-complaint. Discovery. You do use your standard discovery, written discovery, request for admissions to simplify the case, establishing that there are motor carriers that, so that certain bodies of law apply to them. Um, but importantly, um, it's really the deposition which is key. And that starts with the uh, PMKs of the organization. And with the PMKs, <clears throat> the Diaz case, for those of you that are familiar with it, came out and typically the theories of liability against you will either be negligence or vicarious liability for the acts of your employees or secondarily it will be negligent hiring. And in a neg negligent hiring situation you can have much worse facts. You didn't do an investigation. He was a bad employee before. You should have known. You allowed him to continue to drive. However, what people try to do under Diaz, if you come in and say, no, I'm going to be responsible for the torts of my driver. I'm going to admit for the purposes of vicarious liability that I will be responsible and cover his torts. Then you can seek to not give any testimony or evidence on the issue of negligent hiring. They will be barred from seeking that information. And so you can refuse to produce witnesses for deposition. You can refuse to allow witnesses to answer questions. And certainly, if that doesn't work, you can make it an, another run excluding evi any evidence of that at trial because it's no longer relevant once you admit liability. So if it's in a situation where you have admitted liability and you've tried to cut this issue out, then you have to go ahead and fight the battle to get the evidence excluded at every turn. It will simplify your case and many times can get the facts out of the case that are most dangerous to you. Because if 90% of the accidents revolve around driver error, they're going to focus on all of your policies and procedures in the hiring and in the evaluation of the employee, what you knew, what you didn't know, what you should have done, what you never did, and what you required to do. So it's very important that you take all those steps. And as in most of the situations we deal with, it's impossible to even comply with your own safety policies and all of the laws involved. And all the people that you interview are going to have holes in their game. 
and some very severe. If you have a small trucking outfit, they're not going to do all the hiring um, things that they should do in terms of protecting and making sure that they're hiring professional drivers. And you also need to distinguish in your case and make clear from the beginning, am I dealing with a professional driver, a person that really is a truck driver as opposed to someone that really isn't a truck driver. He may have a license, but he's not a true professional. And believe me, you see all different types of drivers and all different types of trucking companies that are operating, that put out different people on the road. And it makes a big difference in terms of your exposure in the case because of the facts that will come out that they may, not, may or may not like. So, documentation, your standard stuff in terms of trying to get all the documentation on liability. That can require a lot of information, many, much of which you will work with someone like Jim to try and help you gather that information. And you will also do uh, things beyond that to supplement what he needs and what other people need, both with liability and damages. So, having said that, I'd like to thank Jim for coming here today. I know the accident reconstruction part of the presentation is always the most enjoyable and most interesting. Um, and like I said, the, the area of law that I was talking about is very broad. What laws applies, we have federal and state statutes that apply, and you could spend two days talking about everything that applies in different situations. The insurance maze alone is very difficult, and it takes a long time to develop over time. And lastly, I will say that when you get into the settlement process, what the claims adjusters want, and that's all of you, is timely reporting, a quick evaluation to the extent you can. I've got a million dollar policy. If I, if I can avoid you going to a lawyer and saying I'm gonna save you money, I, you, know, you can go hire a lawyer, but all I got, all I got is a million dollars, assuming they've done their homework and that's true, then we need to get this thing into some kind of mediation and get the case resolved. But before you go to mediation, you have to have the insurance as you settled. It will not be productive, it will not happen. So if all the stakeholders get together before the mediation and they go ahead and do what needs to be done and then they sit down and they attempt to resolve the case and they're prepared to resolve the case, the chances of su a successful mediation are much greater. So if anyone has any questions for either one of us, you'll be around a long time, yeah. then we'd be happy to speak with you. I don't think we have time for questions now because we have the next speakers. But thank you very much.